You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. Thank you for listening to Leaders and Legends podcast, sponsored by the Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, General Hotels Corporation, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. We have the distinct honor and and great joy of sitting with Governor Eric Holcomb for today's podcast. We can't be thankful enough, sir. Great to be with you, finally. I don't know what you know order in the batting lineup I am, but uh, I think you've I think you've gone through nine or. Well, a lot of the folks who have been on already are people that you either worked with, worked mm. for, know. Yeah, you've interviewed some incredible leaders. Well, I'm going to actually, if you don't mind, maybe do a little same thing I did with Governor Daniels, uh, whose podcast was uh, uh, posted a few weeks ago. Let me just throw some names out there, and then we'll talk a little bit about your background, and, and you can just share some thoughts. The, the Governor Daniels did this. It was absolutely terrific. And these are all people I think you know and admire. Jim Morris. Uh, you just want me to respond to each of them? Absolutely, if you could. Uh, Your thoughts on what he's done for our city, our state, our community. Uh, yeah, for the world. Um, he is kind of like the father to Indiana. Uh, every state should be so fortunate to have a Jim Morris who... His only motive is to see everyone he meets and everyone he doesn't meet reach their true full potential. And he's just there to help. And uh, humble Hoosier, uh, the very definition of one, but competitive as all get out. Absolutely right. Uh, Be remiss if I didn't ask you about a mutual hero. By the time this podcast is... Posted, he will have turned 101, and that's Mr. P.E. McAllister. Yeah. There's the other half, legend <laughs> uh, of the show, so to speak. Um, P.E. is one of those individuals that everyone should strive to accomplish a quarter as much as in their life as he has. Um, he's lived multiple lives. And um, the thing that I love about P.E. McAllister is he pursues his passion and he has shared it along the way. There are not many living Hoosiers who have seen both Winston Churchill (laughs) and Dwight Eisenhower with their own eyes. Yeah, Probably Probably said what was on his mind, too. <laughs> <laughs> he probably tried to sell him a tractor. That's right. Hey, Ike, for this yeah. D-Day thing That's you got right. going on. That's right. But P.E. McAllister is one of them. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the great opportunity to sit down with your Lieutenant Governor, Suzanne Crouch, a tremendous teammate of yours. Yeah. What's it like working with her? Oh, she's the perfect full partner and uh, full of uh, energy and intellect and um, a deep reservoir of local partnerships and, and, uh, experience, um, couldn't have picked a better partner. I was, I was, uh, I was fortunate myself individually, but the state of Indiana has been the direct, uh, beneficiary of her, um, desire to connect and build one Indiana county by county. This podcast is sponsored by the Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, um, my understanding is I bet you probably have a favorite Girl Scout. Would you like to talk my about be- her yeah, influence my on your bride life? <laughs> has some experience in the Girl Scouts um, and grew up around it and in it. And um, she actually traces a lot of her, um, her uh, place in this state 
back to her time in Girl Scouts and 4-H and um, those organizations that fostered an education that was deeper than only at school. And, um, and so she is, to use the word again, passionate about sharing not just her experience, um, but seeing what the Girl Scouts can be in this sh- century um, and decade ahead. I met the First Lady um, about uh, 17 years ago when Rose McVeigh ran for Congress in 2002. Does her experience in the political world make her even more of a valuable <laughs> confidant and advisor? Well, she, she has understands to, yeah. what you're going through and what you went through to become governor and the other roles you've had. Well, she has no excuse being married to me. She she knew what uh, so much of this, <laughs> so much of this uh, entailed, and absolutely, um, her experience was just like mine, and she was in it for all the right reasons as well, and um, let her career unfold chapter by chapter. Didn't write the last chapter first or try to get to that last chapter. Um, and then fortunately our, our two stories merged into one. And, um, of course she's my closest confidant and the boss. All those times you came to state party, I thought you were coming to see me, but no, not at all. <laughs> like, is he going to stop in and say hi yeah. and talk about the campaign? Like, no, I think he's here to see somebody else. Uh, last one. And I would be remiss not to, um, uh, reinforce my standing as a uh, full-fledged member of the Greg Ballard cult. Uh, But you're born in Indianapolis. Mm. You've seen this city grow. What do you think Greg Ballard's impact on the city has been? Right man, right time. Um, Again, we were fortunate that, that he stepped out of maybe his comfort zone Um, Could have gone a lot of different directions, chose to continue to serve, chose to um, probably nothing compared to the Marines. uh, But uh, but as a Marine, uh, he he didn't shirk or didn't ever retreat uh, from that calling and and thought that uh, thought that the city could realize um, a whole new again chapter. And what he was able to do to share Indianapolis, our capital city, um, with not just each other, each neighborhood, block by block, getting down to the street, but then as far away from Indianapolis in the world as you could possibly go, he was sharing the Indianapolis story, saying we're stronger together. And so it's, it's a rare individual that can do that. That can be on a street in Mumbai and be on a street in Hallville and be able to relate um, to the individual that's passing by. Craig Ballard could do that and did that and left this city in a in a better place. When when he was first elected, I was serving as the press secretary for his transition. And, you know, obviously he was unknown. I think that's fair to say. And I remember telling people, you don't understand that this man's view of how a city should be run has been formed all over the world, that his time in the Marine Corps and being stationed in all these different places has given him a perspective that, quite frankly, no one else has had. And you see it in the city, I think. Uh, Last person I ask you about is, a before we move on, is a previous podcast guest uh, who I think represents, along with Oliver P. Morton, uh, the pinnacle of gubernatorial leadership, and that is Mitch Daniels. Huh. Is this a roast? <laughs> it can be. <laughs> well, what? Where do I start and where do I stop? I mean, this, do you remember it, when he yeah. asked you, or was it Bill Osterley who was the campaign person, but who asked you, "Hey, come be a part of this effort in 2004 to turn this state around"? I remember when our um, paths came together as well. I was living in Southern Indiana and minding my own business and um, came up here and heard him speak. He sounded like he almost spoke a different language. 
um, one that that uh, I thought Moore needed to hear. I was in a long line of people that wanted him to um, stay home. He was commuting back and forth, serving the president of the United States at the time. And uh, folks in the Republican Party were looking for a someone to lead the charge. And uh, he was extremely attractive because of his uh, background and his capability and his, again, a little bit like um, Greg Ballard. He had somewhat of a different perspective. He had come out of the private sector as well and um, ran, you know, a flagship company here in the state of Indiana that we're so proud of and uh, North American operations for Eli Lilly. And, when I heard him speak, I went home and started thinking, man, you know, there's something different about him. His communication skills are uh, he unparalleled. Can, he can articulate. Um, he can also break down the most complex, gnawing, nagging um, issue and uh, find the, the solution, the needle in the haystack, so to speak, and the way out of the um, corner that you might find yourself in. And then probably more importantly, attract a lot of other talent, myself excluded here, but attract a lot of, um, other individuals that to put down what they were busy doing and come help and build a barn, so to speak. And, um, and so, I went out to see him in Washington, D.C. at his office. He was the OMB director and um, had a couple individuals from Vincennes, Indiana with me. And we set our niceties. And, and um, as I was leaving, I handed him a few pages of, you know, if you want to be governor, these are the things you need to be doing right now. And I did not know him. And I did not want a job. I was very comfortable in my own life, but I did care a lot about the state of Indiana, and I did want to add my name to the long list of people because people had been courting him. Absolutely. And I just, you know, lived way outside the capital city. And um, and so he, uh, he passed that on to a core group of individuals, and the story goes— Lou Gehrig, another one of his closest friends and lifelong friends, said that he brought this document back and said, some tall guy handed me this, <laughs> and it's pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, of course, he was focused on doing his job, so he wanted other people to do a lot of the vetting and seeing if this was real, but the substance was there. And um, so one thing led to another. Again, I didn't want a job. I so I'll just help. I'll volunteer. I'll stay down here. I'm content with uh, my life. And but uh, as it ramped up, I ended up moving back up here. And I was doing a lot of commuting in addition to my day job. So there were a lot of a um, lot of long days and long nights as a volunteer living in Vincennes and going to Angola and um, a lot of truck stops. You know fueling up with coffee and gas and the new CD, you know, that was out to get me home. And uh, I can tell you where all the truck stops are in, in the state of Indiana. Well, I hate to, to interject, but did Pete Seat tell you I sent him a note after one of your Facebook posts? I sent him a note on Facebook. Pete Seat, who's a communications expert, works for the Indiana Republican Party, used to work for President Bush. Um, I sent him a note on Facebook, said, you and the governor really ought to put out an Indiana restaurant guide. Yeah. And his immediate response was, yeah, that's been discussed. Yeah. And I'm I, like, you guys are like, like the governor is the expert on every diner in every small town in the state. And Pete goes, no, we've talked about that. I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I, I eat my way across the state of Indiana <laughs> for sure. And I've got on my phone, just in my note section, I mean, I can tell you where the best fish is, where the best cheeseburger, where the best ice cream, where the best sushi, for that matter, uh, is in the state of Indiana. Is it? Fair you don't want to get that wrong, by the way. Well, <laughs> that's true. Is it fair to say that that paper by the tall guy led to you being governor eventually? 
if you hadn't gotten in involved hindsight, in Daniels with, right. with no, the I Daniels never would have run. No, I never. I, it, and that's kind of the story of my life is you just you take one chapter, you try to do the best job that you can and the job that you have, um, and then see where it see where it leads. But had I had I not gone and worked for Mitchell Elias Daniels Jr. Um, then I then I doubt very seriously I would have ever um, one gained the experience and the perspective on all the different agencies and how all the pieces snap together and and um, and by the way that that experience proved to me that it could be done and um, that you could realize and achieve those high expectations and. Probably had I not been part of it, I'm not saying it couldn't have been done by someone else, but had I not been part of it, then I wouldn't have been on that um, path. Well, in our podcast with Governor Daniels, we did not get to the actual race, but he's going to let us come back and talk about the race and his time as governor and his time, current Special time, time. As president of Purdue University. Um, but we ended up, I think the last question I asked him was about 9-11 and what he was doing and where he was. But the 2004 Daniels campaign is universally regarded by any reasonable observer as brilliant. What was it like being in the belly of that beast? Um, who gets to claim credit for inventing RV1 and the whole strategy of of kind of down home Mitch? I'm coming back from Washington D.C. and I've been very successful, but. I'm going to travel throughout the state and find out what average Hoosiers are talking about. And it must have been tough running against Joe Kernan for obvious reasons. A good man, war hero, a prisoner of war, and thrust into the governorship in difficult times after the death of O'Bannon. But that race and being involved in that race, what was it like? It was exhilarating. It was empowering. It was um, fun. It was hard work. Um, we fed off of each other. A lot of different personalities. You got to know each other as family uh, because you were together and reliant on each other for that, in that case, 16 months straight. And so um, that's simply not the case um, usually. If you go back, uh, you know, throughout our history, um, that's usually not the case. So, um, having having a leader like Mitch, um, who was willing to work as hard or not harder than everyone else on the team, was also inspiring. So you learned that, um, and you and I have worked in the military and served with some incredible leaders. Um, that's where it starts is at the top. That work ethic is somewhat infectious. And so it was special in the sense that so many people had been on the sidelines and got off the sideline and got into it and put things on hold in their lives. So everyone knew, um, you know, in some sense, the sacrifice that was being made for the greater good of what we believe would be the state's um, future and, um, you know, made lifelong friends out of it. And it was a place where creativity was valued. It was a place where, um, disagreements were valued. It's one thing that's probably lost, um, in a lot of conversation is, especially in the political arena is, it's okay to disagree. Matter of fact, it's healthy. And absolutely through those discussions, uh, you get to the best answer usually and most informed, certainly. And there's not always one and only one right answer. There's just kind of different ways to get there. And so that was a, that was a campaign that, through it all, as he and we were finding our way, um, 
you know, we were, we were writing that story day by day and, uh, we could do it creatively. And so such a unique opportunity just to be a part of it, consider myself fortunate to have been around in that, you know, couple year period in our States. It wasn't 200 years at the time, but you know, we were knocking on our end of our second century. Where would we be in our third century? And would we be on course or drifting and uh, potentially drowning in, as he said, red ink. And um, fortunately we were able to um, turn the ship of state around and we've been going full speed ahead ever since and damn the torpedoes. <laughs> Governor Farragut. Yes. Does it matter to you when you look back at your time, both on the campaign and working for the governor, the first few years were tough in the Daniels administration. Oscom's director for state party in 2006, where we took a little bit of a beating. I had no gray hair. <laughs> I have the pictures to prove it. Did it ever occur to the governor, you know what, maybe what we're doing isn't the right, maybe Hoosiers just aren't going to accept this much change and this much boldness. I mean, cause, because the, the Mitch Daniels of 2005, 2006, and then the Mitch Daniels of, of 2008, who carries Marion County by 15,000 votes in a campaign that you managed while Barack Obama was carrying Marion County by 130,000 votes, roughly. You're good. People, <laughs> people don't. It's see. like you were the communications director. <laughs> yeah. People forget that mm -hmm. that it was a the, the, the toll road deal wasn't necessarily popular. Uh, you had daylight saving time that people were fussing about. Uh, the license branch hadn't hadn't turned. Around. If Mitch Daniels had only done one thing as governor, and that was reform the license branch, and he hadn't done anything else, he still would have been the best governor in the last hundred years. But all these things were happening at the same time. Internally in the administration, was there like, well, maybe we're not listening to Hoosiers like we did during the campaign. You know, does that make sense? It does. It makes well perfect sense, and it's true. Um, and um, maybe, but but I would answer it maybe in a tactical um, way. Was it thought about? Did we do too? He said, "Did we do too much too fast?" Uh, it wasn't because he was detached from uh, where people wanted the state to be. Now, if 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 he has a fault, it would be that he's impatient, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> and we would not be in this position had he not been impatient and able to, not just willing, but able to, courageously forge ahead and understand that sometimes the results take a while to catch up to the action. And so when you're doing big things, addressing big, bold problems, lingering when you're a laggard, but you want to be a leader, I mean, mm -hmm. it takes a while to get in shape. It may hurt getting in shape. The medicine may not taste good going down, but when you get better, all of a sudden, okay, now that was worth it. And that, so you don't, I always say, you don't accumulate political capital just to hoard it or gaze at it. You, you accumulate it and then you spend it to do more good. A person who made that exact same point in a previous podcast is your lieutenant governor, who I believe was a state rep at the time. And she said that one of the things that Daniels would say to, the governor Daniels, excuse me, would say to members of the General Assembly is, when we come out of this recession as a country, Indiana needs to be placed to turn on the boosters and be ahead of other states as we start to grow. Fair statement? Spot. And you remember those things, oh. those conversations happening? Yeah, spot on. And while others were acting in an ill-advised way, we tightened our belt, weathered it, 
uh, and and absolutely came out on the other end in a stronger position, so much so that we're still benefiting from it. And and now it's not um, an expectation. It's almost demanded. And so if we ever reverted back um, to poor habits, it would it would stand out. And it took someone strong enough to take all the actions necessary. And if he was one and done, so be it. And so that was the, you know, it's not a gamble, but that was the rub. I mean, that was, you know, if we're one and done, okay, because we're doing the right thing. It just, it just so turned out that the results caught up with the actions and he went on to win by a, you know, record, record margin. Let me ask you a question. Got more voice, votes than anybody that ever run before, and and it wasn't by accident or luck or it was or the opposition. It was a lot of things, but it was there were the results, and people just knew. Okay, this is the good that came from that. And it shows Mitch Daniels winning Marion County in two thousand eight is probably the most impressive political achievement that I can think of in modern Indiana history. Yeah, especially in the time that it was, to your the point. The phenomenon or, of the Obama candidacy yeah. for, yep. Dan- for that many people to change their votes. Yep. And I used That's to tell when I, was, when I was writing speeches and doing uh, communications for Mayor Ballard, I used to tell him, your audience is the house that has the Obama sign and the Daniel sign in the front yard. Yeah. Because they care about leadership and results. That's right. Let me ask you a question about Mitch Daniels that I asked Mitch Daniels about Richard Luger. Mm. How often did you tell him no? What was it like to tell him no? I don't think I ever told him no. I mean. Or I wouldn't do that. Or I don't know if that's a good idea, Governor. I would, you know, I was I th- probably the reason he kept me around. He probably fired me more times than he. <laughs> um, uh, probably the reason he kept me around was he knew that I would be very honest about what I saw, and that I wasn't just a yes man. I was a doer. I was a guy that tried to get things done. Um, but I was also as as much as he was out connected to the people, um, so was I. And so I wasn't hearing from people trying to spin me. I was hearing from the very people I hear from now when I go grab a cheeseburger in Jonesville at the brick. Right. And um that's part of the secret is um where you get your information. And the, not just the volume of it, but the quality of it. And uh, so to have him be in Richmond and same day I'm in Terre Haute. And oh, by the way, someone who's sometimes not brought up, but Becky Skillman, who was another incredible asset. I mean, I, I really do believe that just as I benefit every minute of every day, um, from having Suzanne's partnership, Becky was the same for Mitch. And she would uh, love to have her on the podcast. Oh, you have to have her on. You have to have her on. I mean, she, um, she was the other half of that ticket. And a lot of time gets spent talking to the, to the governor, but the Lieutenant governor is right, you know, right there standing next to not behind. Does it say something about the fact that, Hoosiers can work together. And and to your point a few minutes ago, um, people listening or or people familiar with Indiana should never underestimate the uh, willingness of Hoosiers to gently but firmly tell you what's on their mind. Yeah, they're blunt. And yeah, and where you're messing up. Does it say something about Hoosiers working together despite differences to foster the common good and to work for progress? And the fact that the man who lost the 2008 Democratic primary for governor is now Governor Eric Holcomb's Secretary of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about 
Jim Schellinger, who is a Notre Dame grad and a very, very successful businessman and one of the, quite frankly, the nicest, funnest guys you'll ever meet in your life. But, yeah. but he ran in the primary in eight, lost to Jill Long Thompson, and then came to work uh, for the IEDC uh, under G- then Governor Mike Pence and now for you. Mm-hmm. I think it says a lot about Hoosiers. Um, and, and, oh, by the way, Joe Kernan, whose portrait sits behind my desk, I put his portrait up because he's an inspiration. Uh, and I wore his POW bracelet when I would go on wow. TV when I was comms director at the Indiana Republican Party just because yeah. he's as good as it gets. That's right. Um, and he came back and served on the Kernan Shepherd um, uh, Local Government Reform Commission. Put that report out. So Schellinger and... Um, Kernan, et cetera, a long line of people throughout our history, by the way, um, have, have done that. And I think it, I think it speaks to who we are in that again, a lot of different opinions, but we typically do agree on more than we disagree. And when you really start to have the discussion, if I were to have, um, Kernan and, Daniels, Pence, and Holcomb all sitting here, we could carry on a conversation about, you know, pick the topic, and we would agree on most of it. Now, we might have some different um, ideas, and that's that has nothing to do with party. That just has more to do with uh, experience, and um, there's more ways to skin a cat than one. We've skipped ahead a little bit, but I want to ask you about something that was life changer for me, and and I know you made the same decision, and that is joining the military. Um, I have a son who just turned thirty last week, did two tours in Afghanistan, and come from a military family. My mother was in the Marine Corps, my dad was in the Marine Corps, a brother was in the Air National Guard, a brother in the it goes on and on and on. Every single one of those people tell me what I've said. It's the best decision I ever made by far life changing. What made you decide to join the Navy? And when you look back on those times, do you say maybe Mary next to marrying Janet, that's the best decision you ever made? Well, it, um, it was, and you know, the, the reason I did, I just had somewhat of a, I don't know if it was an epiphany or, um, it just it occurred to me as a student of history, um, knowing all that had been done for me and you and uh, all Americans by a few select, relatively speaking, individuals who literally laid it on the line, um, many of which didn't come home. So family trees were stopped or dreams dashed. Um, I, I was just at a point in my life where I wanted to do just a little, just give back a little. And it was right around the time, and everyone knew it was coming, Desert Shield Storm, and could have very easily had a couple other opportunities um, that I'd been bird dogging and and uh, could have gone down that road, but it was just kind of gnawing at me again, and so I ended up talking to an individual who had served in the NSA of all places, and he had been over in Riyadh, and um, he was home. And fascinating individual, someone you should think about having on sometime, lives in Indianapolis, um, was involved in the embassy that was built in Moscow that was built and oh, bugged. bugged. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did so they he not was, ever he occupy was, it? He was, they never did. They yeah. you know, started 
figuring out there were microphones in that concrete. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, they built Moscow it on a company in the, in the Soviet, the Soviet embassy in the United, in the United yeah, States. Yeah. It's built on this big giant hill where right. they can see and hear everything. Right. And ours was built in this yeah. bugged out swamp. Tim McGath. You need to invite Tim McGath on. I will. He's a fascinating individual and, and went to Hanover college and uh, older and a friend of a friend said, you keep talking about wanting to serve, go talk to McGath. And I literally, a conversation like this, he was just back from Riyadh. I don't know if he's living in a hole he dug over there or something for you know a few weeks. And, um, and he explained, you know, that there's, everyone knew, but, you know, if you're going to do it, do it now, like before your life starts to unfold and you start to make mm-hmm. other decisions. Um, and so I did and went home and I'll never forget that day. I told my parents that, it, that I had joined the Navy and my mom had been looking at the you know front page of the newspaper oh. and knew something was about to happen and was proud, but said, oh, I can't wait to talk about this, you know, at dinner and I said, no, I'm not talking I, I i already signed i'm leaving like i know the date like it's called a delayed entry program yeah. dep yeah yeah and so i knew um I, when i was chipping out and um and and i'll tell you what i thought i was doing it for others and it turned out what you said i got so much more out of it than i ever put into it i mean it 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 didn't just course correct my life um, not that I was, you know, a troublemaker hellion, but you know, it, it got me focused and, and reinforced by the way, um, I had always valued teamwork and getting the right team chemistry and aligning your personality with your path. And, but, you know, being in the military truly, it's inspiring in the sense that you see people from all walks of life able to excel and then you end up trusting them with your life absolutely and um and so doing something with others is so uh gratifying and so much more so than you could ever do alone and you're sitting there on the first day of basic training Ugh. you've been there for two hours you Ugh. couldn't have done anything wrong like you couldn't have and you're getting screamed at you're like I've been here for two hours. I've slept for an hour and 45 minutes of it. Why am I being screamed? And when I say screamed, I mean, they're screaming at you and yeah. you're thinking, why the hell am I yeah. not playing Pac-Man back yeah. on the block yeah. in Irvington like I should be? What yeah. am I doing? Yeah. And you quickly realize <laughs> this is exactly what I needed. Yeah. They, they break everyone down. Cofield was my, you know, I can still. You remember the name? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Cofield. Um, um you know, you get there late at night and start lining up for your shots. And then the next thing you know, and I was in, um, we, it was Great Lakes, but we called it Great Mistakes up in Chicago. And, you know, you're doing push-ups in the snow in January and February, wearing five, six, seven layers of clothing. And the wind's still going in one side, coming out the other. You can feel it go right through you. Um, but you, you emerge, you all come out of that experience a unit. That's right, which is the point. Yep. Uh, I was at Fort Knox in January, February, March of 87, and it was blisteringly cold, and and um, I was a nerd in high school, played chess, was on the brain game, had no athletic ability at all. Maybe I still don't, but running two miles for the first time, it took me like 30 minutes, and I remember the drill instructor screaming and yelling at me and cursing at me, and your mommy's never going to take your you call your mommy. Your mommy needs you home. And I remembered saying, my mother was in the Marine Corps drill sergeant. She doesn't want me home. That's right. And he's yeah. like, then she's going to be so she told ashamed. told me to get the hell you. out of the house. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let me ask another few questions before we go. And you've been very gracious to let us come back. So yeah. we look forward yeah, to that. Look forward to it too. What was it like as a military man to then become governor and award the Sachem to Medal of Honor recipient, oh, Sammy Davis? Sammy Davis. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll never probably have an experience like that again in my life. And, um, because you'll never meet both of the two sachems and certainly the one to come. Sure. Uh, but Eva Kaur and Sammy Davis, you know, these are, these are individuals that you, we just won't meet another like them. And, um, 
to be able to have that bond with them both, by the way, is, I, I mean, I'm not a selfish guy, but I cherish that um, friendship. Of course, I miss Eva already, but, um, and yearn for the day where I can go bluegill fishing with Sammy. Um, but we've had him over to the house and eaten lunch here. And um, he's, he's, a, he's a national treasure, not just a state treasure. And proud to call him a friend. And by the time the podcast with Governor Holcomb is posted, we will have already posted our podcast with Sammy Davis, which is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And I remember when Governor Pence asked me to emcee the Sachem uh, ceremony for P.E. E. McAllister. Same and thing. You could barely get through it. It's so inspiring. You're listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, General Hotels Corporation, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. We have reached the five questions part of our discussion, and so we'll start. We end this podcast with the same five questions to everyone. Ah. So, question number one, what was your first job? Uh, mowing lawns. <laughs> uh, I had to pay for my baseball card somehow. And, uh, so, You're dating yourself. Yes, I am. And I can still see those cards. Um, yeah. And, and probably, you know, when I got to the age where I could push a lawnmower, I started mowing lawns. Would have started with our own, but then you'd add one and add another and add another. And then you'd be on your 10 speed and <laughs> pulling the lawnmower behind you and going to the neighbors. And, you know, that, that turned into, me and a buddy on the same court grew up on the west side. Um, he ended up buying all my lawns, and he turned it into a business and did it to the to the. Unfortunately, he's passed away, but um, he uh, he grew that business, and probably I sold it too cheap. By the way, percentage of of first cars purchased by let's just say boys in Indiana were financed. Back when we were kids, we're roughly the same age. Yeah, we're either financed by a paper route or lawn mowing. Yeah, eighty percent, ninety percent. Yeah. Question number two: What was your first concert? Uh, well, I guess it'd be it. It depends on how you define that, but I'll I'll say my first official. Uh, you bought your own ticket. Well, I was going to say my my father took me to see Elton John here in Indianapolis, but my father is a pianist. And so, uh, I took it for granted, but I listened to, in, you know, in hindsight, um, I listened to him play every night, classical jazz piano. And it was a concert every night that I could hear, you know, just down the hall. Um, am I remembering correctly? Your mother was a music teacher. No, or a teacher. Was a teacher at teacher. IPS? Uh, she, she, very briefly, she started in Vincennes, IPS, Pittsburgh was where she taught most oh, of her okay. career. She teach Jeff Gordon? She did not, but I get that question a lot. She tried to teach me and see, <laughs> see how that turned out. Question number three, if you could recommend any book for someone to read, which book would you choose? Uh, if only one, you probably hear this answer a lot, but it's, it happens to be true. I'd say the Bible, the good book, um, just because of the lessons to be learned. If it was more of a kind of modern suggestion, um, you know, you know me and you know my personality, I would say, and there's a, this is a, there's a long list. So you could go pick a book and I mean, um, off my shelf and I would recommend it, but, um, Doris Kern's good one. Team of Rivals is is a good read for any CEO, um, just because of the brilliance of Lincoln and his ability to um, turn rivals into you know in Seward's case a, a loyalist, mm-hmm. um, but having having those different perspectives again around the table, all contributing. Um, I, 
I don't know. Obviously, it's probably a little unfair to say this, but I don't know if Bates or Chase or Seward or anyone else could have done what Lincoln did. And uh, he was a master of turning conflict into progress. He was a master at being able to put himself in your shoes. And that is um, rare. One of my favorite quotes of all time is by Jefferson Davis when he wrote his memoirs. And he wrote, uh, who was president of the Confederacy, and he wrote Mm -hmm. in his memoirs, next to the defeat of the Confederacy, the death of Abraham Lincoln is the darkest day the South ever knew. Hmm. Yeah. Question number four, if you, and I know that this is going to be even, this is tough for you like it was to, for Governor Daniels because we're all history nerds. But if you could witness any event in history, in be history. there. Be there as it happens. Past any or event, present or future. Any event in history, be there as it happens. Which event would you choose? <laughs> Well, that is maybe the toughest of them all. Uh, I don't uh, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. That's been a popular one, has it? Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> the rest is history, right? <laughs> exactly. That's been a popular one uh, as far uh, for the non-religious answer, sure. like resurrection. Yeah, and that's where that's occurred to me for a nanosecond there. But I'd say the signing of the Declaration. I mean, that was flag on the ground these tough questions we're trying to prepare you for 2020 governor (laughs) the last question you have to come back (laughs) (laughs) the last question is if you could have dinner with anyone in the world two hours off the record talk about anything living today whom would you choose living today uh my answer would be whatever mood i'm in uh there are different categories so if you were thinking about can I give you can I give you a couple different moods? You're the governor. Okay. Yeah, it's, I live here. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would say, you know, if I'm thinking about pushing the limits and innovation and um, how to think about things in terms of a decade later, um, a Musk or a Bezos or someone of that cut. Um, I you're think, a sports nut. I'm a well, yeah. I'm a sports nut. So you could. There's a long list of people, but you know, I grew up. This is pre Colts, and I grew up a Miami Dolphin fan. Um, because Bob Greasy was from Purdue, from Evansville. Yep, and played for the Dolphins. So I ended up, but I became a nut for Dan Marino, like maybe stalker. And, um, so I was a huge Dan Marino fan. So, you know, two hours with Dan Marino, I would say though, if, if it was just look, you know, if I'm in my job here, maybe Modi or she or Abe, 60% of the world's population lives in Asia. Sure. And, and the more that, you know, we're a, export um strong state and so that's that market's critically important to us um so any of those any of those three guys you know um china japan or india um but if i just wanted to have dinner um and let the conversation go wherever no motivation other than wanting to be enriched by the experience. I would say Muffet McGraw. The coach of Notre Dame. Yes. Uh, women's basketball team. Yeah. National champion at least, I think, twice. She's won it twice. She's won it twice. Yeah, she's been, I mean, to uh, nine final fours. Um, Talk about someone who speaks multiple, her mind. Speaks her mind, leads, trailblazer, motivational, true definition of leader. Um, high expectations. Um, she is a, um, she's the best coach in the state of Indiana. And I say that with all due respect to a lot of other good ones, (laughs) um, past and present. Um, but I just, I have a lot of admiration for her. And so I would think that if I had two hours, 
uninterrupted where it wasn't going to, you know, where the conversation just could go wherever I would learn a ton. Thank you, Governor Holcomb. Uh, I've said this in private conversation. I've said this on other podcasts and will continue to say it. I've said it on television. There is no more down to earth person I've ever met in my entire life, more naturally friendly and genuine than you. You're no different than when I first met you, however many years ago. Uh, you're in the category with Dan Coates and Greg Ballard of being mm. honest and genuine, mm. and what you see is what you get. We thank you for your time today, and we look forward to coming back and talking about being governor, running for governor, and your priorities moving forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. 